Despite all the cruises I've done, I only once came across someone actually living on a cruise ship. I tried to find out from the cruise industry how many people live or retire on cruise ships, but nobody knew. It seems very few do, despite how attractive the idea seems. It got me wondering, why do so few people do it? Is it the cost, the practicality, or do the cruise lines just make it really hard to do? I have the answers. If you're new here, welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, and it's my goal to make it fun and easy to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations. Living or retiring on a cruise ship is a story that newspapers and the media love to cover. They've written really frequently about Beatrice Muller, who lived for 14 years on Cunard's QB2, Lee Wachstetter, known as Mama Lee, who lived on Crystal Serenity for over 12 years, Morton Jablin, who lived for 13 years on Region 7 Seas, and Mario Salcedo, known as Super Mario, who's been living on Royal Caribbean for over 20 years. So I started by exploring what it cost these well-known residents to live on their cruise ships of choice. The person who does it cheapest is Mario Salcedo, Super Mario. He has revealed what it costs him and the five steps required if you want to live cheaply on a cruise ship in various interviews, including Washington Post, US Today, and with the vlogger Alana Zingano. First, if you want to live as inexpensively as possible on a cruise ship, you need to decide which line you're going to live on. He chose Royal Caribbean because it's a mass line and offers lower fares than premium and luxury lines. Look at your chosen line's loyalty program next. He chose Royal Caribbean as their crown and anchor program offered a perk absolutely critical to him as a solo traveler, a lower surcharge of just 50% versus the normal 100%. Then they gave him other perks like drinks vouchers, which again saves him money. Secondly, decide the cabin you can live in. He chose an inside cabin. Now living in a small inside cabin is not appealing to me long-term, but may work for you. Remember again that many lines you pay 100% surcharge to travel solo. Thirdly, decide if you're going to stick to one ship or use multiple ships within your chosen line. The way to keep living costs down is to constantly jump ship to ship within a, any particular line. Mario says he keeps his costs down by chasing itineraries on various Royal Caribbean ships with the lowest price at any particular time. Fourthly, and linked to this, is stick to the Caribbean for most of the year. Mario says 80% of his cruises are in the Caribbean because it's the cheapest place to cruise. Around about 15% of his cruises are then repositioning cruises because again, these tend to be much more inexpensive. For example, transatlantic crossings, east to west coast repositionings, and so on. He hardly ever cruises in Alaska and Europe because they are just so much more expensive on a weekly basis. The fifth decision is how low can you keep your outgoings? There are no escaping taxes, port fees, gratuities. However, Mario hardly ever leaves a ship in ports and almost never ever pays for excursions. He doesn't do specialty dining, go to the casino, buy drinks packages, but he does have Wi-Fi to keep connected and to work. So how much will doing it this cheap way actually cost you? So Mario targets an average base daily fare across the year for his solar cabin of $150 a day before taxes. Taxes and port fees are around $20 a day, then gratuities around $15 a day, then Wi-Fi, once that's all added, it comes to around about $200 a day. So it costs him around $72,000 a year before drinks, shopping, laundry, tours, and so on. If Mario followed the same approach in a balcony cabin, he estimates that will cost him at least $100,000 a year. What does it cost the other travelers that I mentioned earlier to get a sense of how this stacks up? Well, Mama Lee, Lee Wachstetter from Crystal admitted to the Washington Post that it cost her at least $175,000 a year. That's about $480 a day. And of course, she had much more included in that than Mario. Beatrice Muller, who lived on the QE2 back in 2008, said she was paying around $60,000 a year for her inside cabin, even before gratuities and onboard spending. That's around about $80,000 in today's money. Now to see if the cost of using Mario's five-point system that keeps us in the Caribbean 80% of the time compares to living on a ship that would see much more of the world would be, I looked at extended cruises, including world cruises cost as a guide to see what that would be. One of the longest but best value world cruises is Royal Caribbean's nine-month, 
274 day, 60 country world cruise between December 2023 and September 2024 on Serenade of the Seas. If I pro rata up the fares from that from 9 to 12 months, an inside cabin would cost per person based on double occupancy $87,000, a balcony $112,000. Now on the plus side, this cost includes gratuities, taxes, a drinks package, full Wi-Fi, laundry, and even some excursions. So many of the big add-on costs that Mario and the others did not have included are included in that price. But the big catch is these are costs per person for double occupancy. So even with Mario's 50% surcharge for an inside cabin Royal Caribbean, it would cost $131,000 a year to explore the world over double his $72,000 by staying in the Caribbean 80% of the time. So this shows Mario's point that to really control costs, if you want to live on a ship, you need to stick to the Caribbean rather than explore the world. So one compromise would be cutting back on seeing the world, which would actually, in my view, remove one of the big attractions of living or tiring on a ship, certainly for me anyway. Knowing the scale of cost is one thing, but what do the cruise lines think? And are there other hurdles stopping more people like you and me doing this? I found that both of these offer some really big fundamental challenges. I mentioned earlier, I was on a cruise where I came across someone living on that particular ship. One evening, I had dinner with one of the officers and he told me that they were trying to tactfully encourage that person to leave and stop living on the ship. As the guest aged, they were starting to expect demand and require much more help and much more care and were placing increasing demands on the crew beyond their roles. The officer said to me quite bluntly, cruise ships are designed and run for short-term vacation travel. They're not set up for people to live on permanently, certainly not people who are retired and aging. They're not designed to be residential or retirement homes. They don't have the medical, they don't have the care facilities, they don't have the support to cater for residents that need it. Not only are we not really welcome to live on the ship, the more I explored, I found several key hurdles that I'm sure are the reason fewer people live or retire on ships. First, you need to be in good health and you need to stay that way. The medical care on a ship is not designed to deal with ongoing health issues. It's designed to deal with minor illnesses and some injuries. They can't provide ongoing prescriptions, for example, to cover what you need for the year. Secondly, you'll have no dental care whatsoever on the ship. Third, getting insurance will be really difficult and extremely costly. It's hard enough to get insurance even for a three month long world cruise, as I discovered when we did uh, several legs of a world cruise. We struggled to find insurance and it was pretty expensive. Fourth, you still need a home country permanent residence to do things like banking, to qualify, receive pensions or benefits, to be registered with a doctor, where mail can be sent to, to do your taxes and so on. Fifth, when I listen to interviews with people like Super Mario and Mama Lee, I feel friendships and loneliness are actually a real issue when you're living on a ship long term. Living on a ship, you meet loads of people. However, they're churning through every single week. You, you'd struggle to build friendships. And I think you could probably end up feeling, despite all these people around, relatively lonely because we just won't have ongoing friendships, relationships, and of course, we won't be seeing our friends and family on land. Sixth, repetitiveness will be an issue. All those who live on ships, I discovered, don't go off in the ports because they've been to them many times. They've seen what they want to see. It just becomes very repetitive. Entertainment on board will also be repetitive because the same shows are on board for years and they just keep doing them over and over again. The same guest entertainers keep coming on because they can. Next, there will be interruptions. The pandemic, for example, meant people living on cruise ships for years had to leave for years. Ships go into dry docks regularly, ships may be chartered, and if you're living on the ship, you will not be able to stay on the ship. I guess if you're someone like Super Mario, you'll simply just jump to other ships around those other than, of course, the pandemic. And of course, logistically, it's pretty complex. You have to book every single cruise across the year individually, meaning you could be booking up to 52 cruises and ensuring, of course, all the logistics of staying in the same cabin and so on. Of course, there could be a solution to some of these. There are a few permanent resident ships, however, which could be an alternative. The World Residence at Sea is the longest established permanently 
privately owned residential ship. It has 165 units, which range from studios to three bedroom apartments, but they cost millions to buy. And then the annual fees range from $113,000 a year if you own a studio, up to over a million dollars a year if you own a three bedroom suite. Storylines is a new residential line. Their first ship is uh, the MS Narrative. Their studios to buy range from $350,000 with the $55,000 a year maintenance fee. Then they offer penthouse costing many million dollars and again, very high annual fees. I could see that living on a cruise ship is possible, but the costs are enormous. There are lots of barriers and it's in reality not especially welcomed by the cruise lines. It's a great fantasy. It's a great idea. And now you know what it costs. Why not find out more about some other things that make no sense on a cruise ship in this video, where I start by talking about something that totally threw me. See you over there.